everyone, and welcome to today's press briefing here at the CIG Television Studios. I'm Donna Bush, as always, glad that you could join us here on our various channels as well as on Radio Cayman. We begin with a prayer from Pastor Clayton Martin. Father God, I do come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior and King. Lord God, this is your world. We are your people, the sheep of your pastor. Lord God, you are aware of all that goes on in our world. You know our challenges, the uncertainties, and you know our fears. You see how lives have been ravished, impacted negatively, devastated by this virus. We ask for your help. Likewise, we want to say thank you for helping us here in the Cayman Islands. Father God, our bodies are the temple of the Lord. You have given us men and women who have knowledge to develop the necessary vaccine to help us cope, to help us heal. You know our bodies. Many are struggling regarding the acceptance of this vaccine. Help them to be able to discern what to do at this time particular time and what is needed. God, I pray for those in governance, our leaders, our health practitioners. Please give wisdom, guidance, and direction in decisions made and decisions that will be made. Lord God, you know what's needed for the good of people and the glory of God. Cause all to be done with you in mind to the praise of your glory and for the good of humanity. Father, we thank you and we ask these favors in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Amen. And thank you very much, Pastor Martin. We now welcome our panelists, His Excellency the Governor, Mr. Martin Roper, Premier, the Honorable Wayne Panton, Minister for Health, the Honorable Sabrina Turner, and Minister for Tourism, the Honorable Kenneth Byron. In studio with us are the Deputy Governor, the Honorable Franz Manderson, the Medical Officer, uh, Officer of Health, Health, Dr. Samuel Williams Rodriguez, members of the media, senior civil servants, invited guests, and of course our sign language interpreter, Ms. Carolyn Powell. First we go to our Honorable Premier, Mr. Wayne Panton. Thank you very much, um, Donna, and let me say thank you to, to um, all my colleagues and His Excellency for joining us this afternoon, and thank you to those members of the press who are present and other colleagues and the civil service and certainly also those who are watching and listening to um, this press briefing. I have called today's press briefing um, to speak directly to you, um, our citizens and residents of the Cayman Islands, as well as those who eagerly want to visit our shores um, and share our vision of a safe, healthy, and prosperous future. It saddens me that our community is becoming increasingly divided. This is the exact opposite of the spirit that saw us successfully endure shelter-in-place orders and other public health measures for the greater part of 2020. I assure you that as the elected government, we have heard your voice, your voice notes, read your posts, uh, your emails and messages, and carefully listened to your concerns. Some of you are worried about moving from our status quo to a new unknown. Many are worried about their children, elderly, and vulnerable loved ones. Some have used all their savings, cannot receive any more loans, are, and are on the verge of losing their businesses. Many are pro-vaccine, while others continue to express doubts. Some are worried about whether or when they will be able to return to work to provide for their families. Each story and concern is real, heartfelt, and deeply personal. Adding to this angst, there looms an undercurrent of interference and competing agendas which some will say is merely part of the political landscape. Nevertheless, we as a government are determined to not allow this added factor 
to detract or distract us from continuing to protect the interests of our people. I will say here that I appreciate the support of the Leader of the Opposition in our efforts to get people vaccinated. And the former Premier has now made it clear, abundantly clear, that he too supports vaccines. But with roses comes a little thorn. Uh, just a few weeks ago, they were suggesting that government um, didn't have a plan in place and insisting that we throw open our borders on September 1st. I think in his most recent utterance, um, the former Premier has acknowledged the plan and is urging government now not to open on the 14th of October. I suspect the country is happy uh, that we chose not to follow their advice um, as to when to open, and it seems now so is the former Premier. When the PAC government was given the privilege of forming the government in April, we accepted the solemn responsibility of developing and implementing a plan for safely reopening the Cayman Islands. We presented this plan to the country in early July, as we recognize that despite the success of the lockdowns and the closure of our borders, we could not remain in that state forever. That is neither possible nor sustainable. Today, we have successfully worked our way through initial phases of the plan. <coughs> Tomorrow, September 9th, we move to phase three, which entails allowing um, and quarantining all securely verified vaccinated visitors on island. After receiving their negative PCR test after um, quarantine, they'll be able to swim in our crystal clear waters put their toes in our sand and be the first tourists to enjoy Cayman Kind since March 2020. I will leave my colleague, the Minister of Tourism, to speak more in relation to phase three and what that involves. But that brings me to Monday's unsettling news of 24 new cases of COVID-19 um, here in Grand Cayman. These 24 cases involved 23 travelers and one household member who did not travel, but quarantined with family members who traveled. 15 of the 24 were unvaccinated, and nine were vaccinated. Since February 2021, we have had 325 cases of COVID, 263 of which um, were unvaccinated, and only 62 of which were vaccinated. I hope these numbers will serve as an impetus for those who haven't yet been vaccinated to go and get vaccinated. I therefore want to remind everyone that if you or someone you know is not yet vaccinated, getting the first shot, on, first shot tomorrow on the 9th of September means you could be fully vaccinated by the time we are scheduled to enter phase four of the plan on the 14th of October. Those who get vaccinated will be going a long way in protecting themselves, everyone they know and love, the community, and our country. But you know, getting vaccinated goes a lot further than that. When the pandemic began, we immediately focused on protecting the most vulnerable, namely our senior citizens. We were all taken aback by the horrible way in which the first wave of COVID-19 seemingly swept away so many elderly uh, people across the, the globe. Then our collective hearts surged with pride when our seniors set the example and bravely stepped forward. To receive the first jab of, of the COVID-19 vaccine without hesitation. Thank you once again for doing the right thing and stepping up and blazing the path for the rest of us. Now as our global uh, battle with COVID-19 rages on, we must once again shift our focus and direct our attention to a new front. We have one main group that remains vulnerable and depending on us to serve as their collective shield by getting vaccinated. That is our children. Those who are younger than 12 cannot at this time take the vaccine. 
And it is our precious little ones who depend on us to make the right decision for their well-being that I'm most concerned about when we do stop enforcing quarantine. The bottom line is that, as always, we need to help protect those who cannot protect themselves. When the pandemic was first declared in 2020, the data and the medical evidence at the time showed us that the earlier COVID-19 variants did not have a harmful impact on children. What we don't know is if we can say the same about additional variants being transmitted, including the predominant Delta variant, and for that matter, any other variant that may morph into being in the future. We are still learning the extent to which that Delta variant affects children. And we, the government, public health, and yes, you, are keenly following the research and scientific learnings. One of the many benefits of being in our relatively safe Cayman Islands bubble is that we have had the time to watch as COVID-19 evolves throughout the Caribbean and around the world. We have had the privilege of not having to simultaneously fight off COVID-19 while we struggle to make plans that we believe will work for the Cayman Islands. We've had the full benefit of learning through observation. For instance, we've learned that Delta variant, the Delta variant is more contagious than other COVID-19 virus, uh, virus strains, and that all unvaccinated people, including children from ages 5 to 12 years old, are at a higher risk um, getting not only, of getting not only COVID-19, but the Delta variant. Vaccination is the best protection against the various variant as evidenced by many hospitals reporting predominantly unvaccinated patients and seriously ill patients. We also know that the rate of infections amongst vaccinated individuals continues to be much lower than for unvaccinated individuals around the world. <coughs> that is true here as evidenced by our recent positive results. We know that some countries have had higher success with longer periods between first and second doses, and that while vaccines may not slow transmission of the virus as much as was originally hoped, especially with the variants, vaccines significantly prevent severe disease and death. Ladies and gentlemen, the Delta variant is a game changer. Um, many countries that experience significant success in their COVID-19 fight are now facing a new wave of challenges. In Singapore, the government said Monday that it is contemplating re uh, reintroducing restrictions as COVID-19 cases um, or case numbers have quickly spiked. And just five days ago, the United Kingdom reported its worst COVID-19 death toll in six months, which is more than 200 deaths in 24 hours. Much closer to home, we are all watching the worrying situation in Jamaica, where they struggle with a spiraling infection rate, which is severely impacting their health care system and their economy. The reports that we read are concerning, but we continue to observe and learn, and we understand and appreciate the scope of what we are facing. We consider the data, the scientific evidence available, and the concerns of all sectors of our community, and use this to help inform our decisions. Our goal remains focused on delivering a safe reopening of our borders. My government has been clear. We must reopen the borders, but we will only do so safely and in a way that protects our most vulnerable, ensures our children are educated, and allows our people return to work. We all will have to work together to continue our success story. So as I mentioned earlier, based on the information currently available to us, we will move to phase three tomorrow. We are prepared for this next step. And I want you to be prepared too. All evidence proves that your best defense against severe illness and death is to be vaccinated if you're able to do so. As we go into phase three, we enter another important evaluation and assessment period. 
Our measured and calculated approach to transitioning between phases has served us well in the past and we will continue this approach. Whether or not we move to phase four on the 14th of October will depend heavily on what we observe over the next few weeks. Let me repeat that. Whether or not we move to phase four on the 14th of October will depend heavily on what we observe over the next few weeks. Further, it is important to us, for, all, for us all to understand and be prepared for the changes in our daily life and behaviors that will make a safe, further reopening possible. It is important that you hear from us on matters that are important to you. We intend to hold another press briefing next week during which we will outline details of our, of our plan that will help us do just this. In fact, it is our plan to hold weekly press briefings until we notify you otherwise to transparently keep you informed. From the outset, we envisaged um, or envis envisioned that moving to the higher phases would bring important changes uh, and a gradual shift away from the status quo along with the additional um, safeguards for the community. Caymanians know that prevention is better than cure. And that is why we have always envisioned a gradual reopening. Let me be clear. Moving to phase four and the risks associated with it does not mean we go from where we are straight in the direction of a lockdown. There are many public health measures that we can utilize as protective layers in addition to vaccination to keep each other safe and to keep economic activity going in this country, which has a 70% vaccination rate now. We may encourage you to do things like spending less time indoors, more time outdoors, consider staying home and, and self-isolating if you must travel. If you plan to travel, uh, we may ask you to carefully consider if that travel is indeed necessary. We may, may recommend the wearing of masks in some settings while requiring it in others. I assure you that the government will continue to provide you with the best information we have about how you can do the activities you want to safely. Next Wednesday, you will get a you get, you get to preview our COVID-19 new normal. You will learn what to expect when we move to the next phase. You will learn how all of us can work together to mitigate the increased risk of transmission. You will know what is required and asked of every person on our shores to help us safely reopen. Again, let me be clear. If we find that the global situation, the scientific evidence, or the concerns raised by you, the people, make this plan untenable, we may respond accordingly. If we remain confident that we can safely reopen, we may proceed to the next phase. And that may be whether or not the, the vaccination rate is at 80% at that time. In the meantime, I implore you, as I have done repeatedly since you, you placed your trust in me as Premier, please get vaccinated. If you are eligible, please, and I repeat, please get vaccinated. At the early stages of our vaccine rollout, as I said, our elderly stood up and stepped up to the plate. We stood together to protect grandpa and grandma, and our people appreciated it. Now we must protect our children and vulnerable people who do not, do not yet have a vaccine. We know we may have people contracting COVID-19 in the future. But if those who contract it have an immune system bolstered by the vaccine, the health outcomes will be far better than if they are unvaccinated. Many medical professionals are hopeful that as vaccination uh, rates in the U.S. continue to increase, the number of COVID-19 cases will continue to decrease, and some are even projecting a sharp easing 
later this month. As a key source market for our tourism visitors and a major destination for residents, we're certainly optimistic that that may be the case. However, if the global situation gives us pause ahead of moving to phase four on the 14th of October, we will not he hesitate to put on the brakes and we will do so unapologetically. Unapologet uh, this is not about raising the bar, this is not about moving the goalposts, this is about caring for the safety and health of our people and our residents. We have always been clear about that. Let us also be clear that this will come at a cost if we take that approach. The government is keenly aware of the many businesses that remain closed, the many people connected to the tourism industry who cannot earn a living in their chosen profession. If we cannot begin the reopening process on the 14th of October, we will have to consider new measures to support these businesses from going under and extensions of the current stipend regime. We will not stand aside and see Caymanians and Caymanian businesses um, collapse and disappear owing to no fault of their own. This too is a real source of concern and even anxiety for many Caymanians, one which we cannot ignore. We will continue to be transparent. We will keep you informed and involved in our discussions as we honor our commitment to you, the people of the Cayman Islands, to safely reopen our beloved Cayman Islands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be here with you again. I clearly didn't get the memo about the jackets to the <laughs> premiere, but I, but I do have my turtle tie on, if people yes, can see more clearly. Excellent. Um, I, I, mean, I do recognise, like the premiere, that the 24 COVID cases um, were of great concern to the community, but I, I do agree with the premier as well that we, we do have to keep that in perspective. Um, I think we had 45 positives in the whole of August. Um, and again, a key takeaway for me about those figures was that um, only nine of the 24 were vaccinated. Um, so even if those vaccinated people were not to do any period of quarantine, they are much less likely to transmit the virus to others than unvaccinated people. So the risk of an outbreak of community transmission is still greatly reduced. Um, but of course, um, we, have, um, uh, we have plans still in place to, to, to keep all those who are not vaccinated um, doing 14 um, days. Um, but I, I do sort of believe we, we have to move forward as a jurisdiction and we have to not allow ourselves as a community to be paralyzed by fear. That's why my main focus and that of the Deputy Governor is ensuring that the civil service gives the government the very best evidence-based policy advice on which to take decisions, which of course takes full account of the science, the Chief Medical Officer's views and stepped up engagement with health experts at Public Health England who have engaged with us and other overseas territories throughout this pandemic and provided helpful support. Um, and let me just say again from perhaps my unique vantage point that this Premier and Government continue to take the health and the welfare of everyone on these islands very seriously. So we do have to be a little bit patient. The civil service is working very hard, fine-tuning the advice to ministers about the reopening programme and using up-to-date information f from expert sources. Um, so we need to give the, that civil service time to do its work and we need to give ministers a little bit of time to, to reach carefully balanced decisions on next steps. And I do want to pay tribute again to our public health professionals and the wider civil service who have protected us very well from COVID risks up to this point. And it is truly remarkable that we have had no local transmission um, for over 12 months. And we're fortunate, thanks to the UK, to have highly effective vaccines. At some point, we do need to let the vaccines do their job. Um, if we are paralysed by fear, there will be real-life trade-offs for everyone in the tourism sector, loss of jobs and businesses, and 
significant mental health issues. And government finances will face serious headwinds if we can't move forward. So these are really tough decisions. A part of the answer may have to be considering mandating vaccines for those who are educating our, our children and for those on the front line. Many countries around the world are introducing vaccine requirements for entries to bars and restaurants. That may be a step too far for some here, but we simply cannot stand still as a jurisdiction, and I believe these measures do need to be considered to ensure we can protect the community and make sure as many as possible get the protection offered by the vaccine. I do think from the UK evidence, it's also worth pointing out that risks to children from COVID are extremely low. Public Health England's evidence suggests that the chances of a child under 18 losing their life to COVID is one in 500,000. Um, but those adults protecting them can get COVID from children, especially under 12s who can't get the vaccine. And sadly, we've seen in the US some quite tragic um, uh, incidents where bus drivers at schools have, have lost their lives having contracted COVID. So teachers, support staff, bus drivers arguably all need to get that vaccine. And please, as the Premier said, do get the vaccine. Let me repeat that our current vaccine expires at the end of October. We have about 6,600 doses left. If we do not use them, as I've said before, it will be really difficult for me to argue that we should be sent any more from the UK. I, I understand over 230 people came forward for a first dose of the vaccine yesterday, which is really encouraging. I hope that's the start of a significant increase in the uptake. But if you want to protect yourself, your family, our children and our elderly and vulnerable for the remainder of this year and into next year, now really is the last time to come forward and get your first dose of this vaccine. In the UK, there is a th feeling that things are largely back to normal. Ch children return to school this week after the summer holidays. Workers are returning to offices. And aside from voluntary wearing of masks and social distancing, life largely goes on now as before. The UK has accepted that COVID cases will occur, but it's relying on the vaccines as the best defence. Now, the easing of restrictions in the UK has seen cases go up. And as the Premier said, deaths have gone up um, as well, 200 <coughs> yesterday. But we were getting 2,000 a day when we didn't have protection from vaccines. So the link between cases and hospitalisation and death does seem to be broken in the UK. Clearly, we still need to monitor that over the next couple of months um, and see how, um, how that uh, develops. But the latest data from Public Health England does show that the vaccine rollout in the UK has already saved over 105,000 lives and prevented over 24 million infections in the UK. The vaccine is quite simply saving lives. A quick word on boosters. Um, it is still expected that the UK will roll out a booster programme this month. Final confirmation is still awaited from the UK Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Um, a study on which vaccine to use and on who should receive it is expected imminently I've been told as early as tomorrow. We here will follow the UK rollout, but London recognised that our context differs from the UK's. The gap between doses here of three weeks is different to the UK, who had a gap of eight to 12 weeks in doses. As it turns out, that longer gap does seem to provide better protection against immunity. We have also had a very little local transmission, so we don't have um, local immunity in our community. So um, uh, that is recognised in London, and I hope we will be able to go even further with our booster rollout once we know the details of um, the UK situation. Let me just end by saying that COVID is going to be with us for some time to come. We need to find a way to be comfortable living with it by all of us managing risk, exercising caution, and having a common sense approach. Just waiting out the pandemic or trying to eradicate it is a forlorn, forlorn hope, especially with this Delta variant. So I urge everyone in the community to support the Premier and his government as they take tough decisions needed to protect lives and livelihoods 
based on the very best policy and medical advice. As a jurisdiction, we need to continue to move forward, managing risk to the maximum extent possible. We can be incredibly proud of how we've done that in Cayman up until now, and that should give all of us continuing confidence and optimism for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We now go to the Minister for Health, the Honourable Sabrina Turner. Thank you, Donna, and good afternoon, everyone. My primary message for everyone this afternoon is that tomorrow, when our borders open to receive visitors, that our health care system is ready. Public Health and Public and Health Services Authority, in partnership with private sector health facilities, have done a stellar job of helping to protect us from COVID-19, and that goes back as far as March of 2020. And I have no doubt that they will be ready to respond again when and if the virus enters our community. From telemedicine to drive-through testing, and our own ability to perform genomic sequencing, the men and women who remain on the front lines helping us to get through the worst of the pandemic are ready, willing, and able to take care of us once again, when and if it becomes necessary. And if it isn't just our dedicated medical professionals that are prepared, our local health care infrastructure has been strengthened throughout the past 18 months to ensure that facilities and programs are ready for any potential surge in the virus. Our islands have expanded capacity of hospital beds and ventilators. The Cayman Islands hospitals has seven ventilated beds, including two negative pressure isolation rooms. There is a further in-house capacity of 20 ventilated beds in the surgical unit. The respiratory care unit is available with six beds if needed. Additional bed capacity is also provided by Health City Cayman Islands and Doctors Hospital in the event that this may be required. In total, we have 42 ventilators available on island with 20 at the HSA and 22 at Health City. Our local facilities have also been improved in many areas to keep patients, doctors, nurses, staff and visitors safe from COVID-19, but most notably by creating a separate area for COVID-19 patients and enforcing safety protocols. In terms of treatment, the COVID-19 task force at HSA has trained clinical teams on how to manage hospitalized patients with severe acute respiratory COVID-19 infections according to guidelines developed by World Health Organization, the CDC, Public Health England, Health Canada, and the European CDC. The hospital is stocked with standard medications recommended for use in the management of COVID-19 and is also sourcing newer immune modulating bio biologics, which are medications used in treatment for certain types of immunologic and inflammatory diseases. We also have an oxygen contingency plan in place to avoid the unfortunate medical oxygen shortages being seen in other countries around the world, including our friend and near neighbor, Jamaica. Most reassuringly, our islands have coordinated health sector response strategy developed through a partnership between the HSA, Doctors Hospital, Health City, and the private health sector community to ensure that we have the resources, supplies necessary to ensure sufficient patient care and the safety of local medical staff. Now, while the Cayman Islands have been preparing to reopen our borders, our medical community has not been idle. Neither have they remained stagnant nor become complacent. To the contrary, the profession that I am proud to have begun my own career as a nurse has been gearing up for any eventuality like no others. 
doctors, and nurses understand the need to be able to spring into action in an emergency by always remaining prepared. For instance, when the emergency field hospital at Family Life Center was demobilized in February, all assets of the 60-bed facility were appropriately placed in a storage by hazard management, Cayman Islands, in case it may be required later on. Assets including a standby generator and mobile hand washing basins were relocated within Health Services Authority to have hands-on if needed quite quickly. Everything has been structured to maintain a state of readiness and with a focus on sustainability. Until this point, we have thankfully avoided a COVID outbreak and the need to use the field hospital. We've achieved this by taking recommended precautionary measures such as social distancing, hand washing, the wearing of masks, and this achievement took the full cooperation of each and every one of us. Once we do move to additional phases of further reopening, we will all have to make adjustments to the way we work, live and play to stay safe. As our Honorable Premier shared earlier, we will learn more about these behavioral adjustments, uh, what they will look like in the next, that's by next week Wednesday. But the fact is, the government has a plan for safely reopening the Cayman Islands, and the success of this plan hinges significantly on each and every one of us cooperating and complying with the public health safety measures in that plan. The decision the government will make over the next few weeks will be as a result of careful review of the data, scientific evidence, and public behaviors. The components of our protective shield are many, and we are willing to adapt and adjust them as necessary as we have done in the past. For example, for the month of August, Travel Cayman recorded 52 breaches by persons in quarantine. 52 breaches. That is a very high number. Now, while the nature and severity of these breaches differ greatly, the report warranted a close review of the system and some changes were made. Travel Cayman implemented additional protocols which will aim to reduce instances of quarantine breaches and the government is carefully considering further adjustments to future phases of the plan, including the possible reintroduction of GPS tracking for travelers in quarantine. The government is agile and willing to adapt our, our policies, plans, and procedures based on many factors, including public behavior as, if, and when necessary to keep our people safe. Again, the safe reopening of the Cayman Islands requires everyone to do their part, the government and the people alike. As we enter phase three tomorrow, September 9th, I remind everyone that we have a powerful protective shield in our arsenal. Each of us can now take a huge individual step to protect ourselves, our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our parents, our grandparents from the most severe illness <coughs> and death by getting vaccinated against COVID-19. As you heard earlier, since February of 2021, we have recorded 325 positive cases. And of those, 81% are, of our positive cases have been unvaccinated individuals. The evidence in support of vaccine is conclusive. COVID-19 vaccinations are currently available free of cost to every single person in the Cayman Islands who is 12 years old or older. 
Vaccine clinics are being held daily at Caymana Bay, except for Thursdays this month, when they will be held by West Bay Town Hall. If you live or work in West Bay, you can head over there tomorrow. And for those of us living further east, vaccine clinics will be held at the Savannah MLA office on September 16th and at the Prospect Constituency Office, 33 Marina Drive, on September 23rd. All of the community vaccine clinics are being held from 4 to 7 p.m. Let me encourage you to please, please, if you haven't been vaccinated yet, and you're able and eligible to do so, to get your first shot tomorrow, to not only help protect the community, but to help us your elected government, as we work to safely further reopen our, border, our borders. I would also like to encourage each and every one of you to continue to practice proven safety hygiene practices. Wash your hands, wear your mask over your nose and mouth when indoors for extended periods or where there are a large number of people gathering. Staying safe also includes taking care of your mental health. The past year and a half has been very, very stressful for all of us. And as you consider the coming weeks and months, I can understand you may feel anxious and fearful. Uncertainty can be unsettling. If you feel worried or overwhelmed, there are many, many resources available to you, including the mental health hotline. Their number is 1-800-534-6463. And others listed are at explore.gov.ky backslash mind. We are all very fortunate to live in a beautiful country that we call home with people we care about. Take some time and enjoy nature. Take a walk and breathe deeply. Call a friend. Take a break from social media. We have carefully observed what other countries have experienced and learned. We continue to follow proven scientific evidence and data that is available to each and every one of us. And we are being guided and advised by a team of professionals whose priority is the safety and well-being of our country and you, our people. Your elected government is keeping your health and safety paramount in all of our considerations and plans. Thank you all for listening and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much, Minister Turner. We now go to the Honorable Kenneth Bryan, Minister for Tourism and Transport. Thank you so much, Donna. I want to thank the audience and those who are watching via social media. It's a pleasure to have you today. My intention today is to provide the public with an overview of changes which will come into effect from tomorrow, September 9th, when we move to phase three of the government's plan to safely reopen our country. Phase three introduces two important changes from phase two. The first is that airlines will be allowed to resume commercial service and will no longer be limited to repatriation flights for essential needs only. The second difference is that vaccinated tourists or persons traveling purely for leisure reasons and who are over the age of 12 years will now be allowed to visit the Cayman Islands. Whereas before, this was limited to returning Caymanians, residents, work permit holders, and others with close ties to the country. One thing that is, does not change in phase three is the quarantine period. Let me say that again. One thing does not change is the quarantine period. Every traveler, whether returning resident or visitor, must still complete a quarantine period, the length of which is dependent upon their vaccination status. Travelers whose vaccination status can be securely verified will be subject to five days in quarantine. A negative PCR test is required on day six for the quarantine period to come to an end. Travelers who are vaccinated but whose vaccinations cannot be securely verified will be subject to 10 days in quarantine. Again, a negative PCR test is required for the quarantine period to end. Anyone who is unvaccinated 
including children under the age of 12, will be subject to the usual 14 days. This applies to Caymanians, residents, work permit holders, and persons who have close ties to the island. Because as I mentioned before, tourists must be fully vaccinated before they can visit in phase three. I think it's important for me to point out that while phase three signals the, country's, the country is open for business, it will not be business as usual overnight. Although the airlines are allowed to start offering services from tomorrow, the demand for flights for international gateways will de be determined how many will be determined. Sorry, let me say that again. The demand for flights for international gateways will determine how many flights and seats the airlines are prepared to offer. I have already approved the new schedule for Cayman Airways, which includes a steady increase in the numbers of flights per week during September and October. British Airways have also confirmed that they will resume their weekly scheduled service from Grand Cayman to the UK on the 27th of September. BA plans to offer at least three flights per week via NASA. More information on the dates and the details of the BA service will be published on the government's website and issued to the media later this week. Although the Ministry of Tourism continues to prepare for the reintroduction of tourism in the safest, most balanced, and practical way possible, we're also continually evaluating the experiences of other countries that are farther along this path and seeing what we can learn from, from their examples. I've also met with stakeholders in the industry and industry partners to ensure that our decision-making process is well-informed and supported by current and reliable information. All of us in the PAC administration recognizes the public's nerve about nervousness about the threat of the virus especially since the infection rates are rising all around us. I understand those concerns. And I also believe that as a country, we have the resources, the technical know-how, and the optimistic, optimist, optimistic spirit required to cautiously and carefully take the appropriate decisions at the appropriate time. I would urge the public to rest assured that the phased approach does not mean that we will throw caution to the wind. Rather, it means that there is time between phases to review and analyze the variety of options and scenarios, including a plan B if phase four has to be delayed for some reason. The time between phases is designed to allow adjustments to be made. And if it becomes necessary, we're willing to make the necessary modifications to protect and enhance the safety and the well-being of our people. I hope this will provide some comfort and reassurance to the public that we are committed to following the safest and most prudent approach to a safe reopening. Additionally, we will continue to be guided by the science as well as the recommendations of the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the Chief Medical Officer, and the Program Board, which is chaired by the Deputy Governor. Phase three, as I said earlier, represents our official reopening, but it will take a while before it's returning to business as usual. In the meanwhile, my ministry will continue working our way through a comprehensive review process, and I look forward to sharing more information with you as it becomes available in the coming weeks. In closing, I want to assure the good people of Cayman that the Park Administration is committed to doing everything that we can to keep you safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Bryan. We're now going to open the floor to the media for questions. We will begin with April Cummings from Radio Cayman. Thank you, everybody. Now, forgive me, my notes are scrawled sideways and backwards, so I'll, I'll try to stay organized here. Um, one of the first questions I have has to do with um, us, how we are going to know between now and the potential next phase, um, whether there is an increase in COVID cases. And I say this because of the way we're testing right now. It's not like the whole population is being tested, right? We're doing it at certain checkpoints or when you go to the doctor. Will, will we be stepping up? the amount of COVID tests that we do in order to see whether, you know, COVID is being transmitted, how will we know? 
And it's okay to tell me that's a stupid question. I just yeah, would like to know. I don't, certainly, you know, from my perspective, um, it's not a stupid question, um, but I, I, um, there is a reality in terms of, you know, the, the, the people that are travelers that are being tested are only tested at certain times. Um, the, if you're talking about, are we doing surveillance testing in, in terms of co the community? Um, I think probably um, Dr. Williams would be the, the yeah. best person to respond to that and to provide those, those relevant details. Dr. Williams, let me get out of your way. Yeah, yep. he'll go over oh, here. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been here. <laughs> Yeah, the intention is to increase surveillance once we open up. Uh, we will survey and we will test regularly not only those frontline workers, but also uh, those in the tourism industry that are in contact with travelers. But yes, we will definitely increase surveillance uh, once we're the border. And in terms of um, you know mandatory testing, is there have we talked about doing that in other areas, or will it sort of be voluntary? Um, and just different groups across. As you probably are aware, they're working in uh, regulations about um, testing for unvaccinated frontline workers. And that there's a discussion and that should be expanded to other sectors depending on the interaction with the, with the public. Um, and while we while you're trapped here, um, how have things been going in terms of it's taken a lot of resources and effort and time over this period to do the testing? Um, how is that going in terms of resources and the expertise of the people who are doing the PCR tests? I've run into my share of them recently because I travel, but um, how is that process and system going? Well, the, 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 the teams that are doing testing, of course, they're more well more experienced now than being doing PCR testing for over a year. Uh, we know that apart from the HSA also right now the doctor hospital and health city Cayman Island provide PCR testing and we are aware of two other facilities on island who may have the capability also to do PCR testing if needed. Apart from PCR testing we are looking at other type of testing like lateral flow tests, antigen tests if needed if we get to the point and this will be mainly to do screening for large groups. And I think this might be a question for you as well. Um, and again, this does depend on what happens over the next phase or so. Um, how prepared are we in the event that we do start to have an increase in symptomatic cases in terms of our resources? Um, I've had people ask me questions uh, that I hadn't heard in a long time about ventilators, pediatric ventilators, that sort of stuff. How are we in terms of our resources? Should we see an increase in um, cases? I think the minister actually mentioned uh, that, but we do. We, are, uh, we have 42 ventilators on, on island. Uh, we are very prepared. You look at the numbers of ICU beds and ventilators in the Cayman Island compared to other countries against the population, we are way, way more prepared than any other country in the world. Thank you. I just wanted to make someone else say I appreciate that. All right. I think those were the big questions. Um, April, just in relation to your first question, I, I, I thought what you were saying originally was <laughs> between sort of now and the end of before we move into phase four. Right. Um, I think I phrased it that way, but actually what yeah, I meant okay. was but you, As long as you're satisfied in terms of the <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. am. And the preparation in terms of infrastructure was important as well. Um, the last question um, I think is probably yours, but it might be uh, Mr. Bryan's as well. Um, just what you're seeing is the greatest challenges in this period here. I see it from a tourism perspective and travel perspective as as well, but also just in terms of the economy, because these things both go together. What are some of the greatest challenges you're seeing for us over the next few months? Well, um, months um, or weeks, I think. I, I suppose mean, weeks first and then months, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, let's break it down into <laughs> bite-sized pieces. <laughs> um, you know, our, our challenge over the next few weeks is to try to balance all the interest, try to get the best possible information. We are going to rely on our, our colleagues um, from the program board, as, as um, um, the Minister for Tourism mentioned, sorry, uh, for Health mentioned, um, both of them actually mentioned it. Um, we're going to rely on the best possible information from them. We are, we are actually, I think, um, um, the His Excellency, His Excellency, and I were having a conversation earlier. Um, we may, we may have access um, to um, some of the experts from Public Health England, and we're going to try to have a 
conversation there. Um, so a combination of the best possible advice, information, um, expertise, um, that may include other, other local expertise as well, um, to try to uh, nail down exactly where our risks are, um, what the balance is in terms of weighing up safety versus the possibility of, of um, reopening our, our borders to um, and, and eliminating the, the, the quarantine um, to increase the numbers. The, the reality is the, the, the tourism stakeholders say to us that um, the only way we're going to have um, a significant increase in tourism is to lift the quarantine. Obviously, lifting the quarantine um, is, is, a, is one thing that's actually producing a lot of uh, anxiety and concern with our, with our people. So we're, we're trying to balance all these interests and trying to, you know, we've got to, to sort of educate both sides um, and then make a decision, decision ourselves as to how we're going to move forward. Um, the time frame is getting very compressed. Um, the reality is we can't wait until, you know, the week before to make a decision. So we're going to come, come be very active in the coming few weeks um, to try to get the best possible information <coughs> and make the, make the best possible decision and then communicate that decision uh, very clearly to all stakeholders, um, to the people of the country so that they understand um, if we are going to, to move forward with the reopening and lifting the quarantine, exactly what we have in place, what we are proposing to do to um, ensure that we have very clear public health guidelines and protocols, um, how we're going to protect people. Um, if we're not going to do that, then we have to be we have to be fair to the the tourism stakeholders as well, and and basically tell them as as quickly as possible, um, and then recognize that we are going to have to make plans um, to to continue to support um, those those people who are are participating in that industry and who are suffering and have been suffering um, for the last 18 months. I think the Premier did an amazing job uh, answering it, but just say that um, particularly with the expectations as to the answers to much of the questions, we almost have to have two plans ready going at once. Um, as you can imagine, like the Premier highlighted, if, if we don't move forward with the timeline that is suggested, it will have ripple effects. And what do we do then? Because the next thing will be questioned is, okay, if you're not taking away the quarantine, what are you going to do about those stakeholders? So looking at those, um, what, what could potentially be an other f option if we don't go forward with the, or delay um, the quarantine removal, as well as determining whether or not there could be some amendments and adjustments to the plan that we have that will give people the comfort of safety, because we all here represent the public and they want to be comforted. Of course, everybody wants business to get back to normal. All the tourist workers and business owners, everybody wants them to do well, but doing it making sure that nobody is harmed anyway. So balancing that is probably what's the first thing we got to do within the next week or so after we speak at program board and make adjustments. So hopefully we can have better answers by my next week or two weeks from now. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, thank you very much, uh, you. April. We now call on Wendy from CNS for her questions. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to speak fast. <laughs> you do. Mr. Brini, can I just check, first of all, Minister Turner, the 52 um, breaches of quarantine. Can I just check, first of all, were those all people that were isolating voluntarily under the new um, tr on trust basis? And what dates those were? What? The that, period of time. It's for the month of, of of August, but the breakdown in whether or not they were on the honor system or not, I don't have to get you that information. Okay, thank you. C can I just come in on that, Wendy? Because I, I have been in, in discussion with the police commissioner okay. about this. I mean, I think just to sort of say sure. as well, the RCIPS view is that there has been an increase in, in, in suspected breaches, but they don't believe that is linked to the removal of the electronic tagging. We seem to have had people visiting, delivering things, and people trying to go and visit people in quarantine. Um, they are investigating currently 20 suspected, so they've had a lot, a lot more reports of breaches than can actually be investigated, because when they look into it, they turn out not to be uh, things that need further investigation. But there are 20 
currently being investigated, and eight of those occurred since the 9th of August. And I know that two specific cases have been referred this week to the DPP. And just worth reminding everybody that you know, the current law is if you breach these regulations, you could get a fine of up to $10,000 and two years in prison. So people really do need to observe these uh, regulations. And cases have gone to the DPP, and we will have to wait and see what the DPP decides on those. OK, thank you. Following up on that, and I think it's going to have to be Dr Williams, which is effectively, it follows a little bit on from what April was saying, in, in how, how the testing is working for, with regards to these breaches and how it's going to, to, to move on forwards from voluntary isolation. If people are, people are being tested at the end of, if they're verifiably vaccinated and they're, vo they're vo quarantining on trust, they get tested on day five. Day six. Day six. If they're positive, they remain in quarantine. Correct. That's correct. But we also now know that um, these people could have breached quarantine, and you wouldn't know that. Mm. So how how are we how are we dealing with the frontline testing? When you talk about front, are the delivery food delivery van drivers being tested? Who who else is being tested to help us understand whether COVID may have already leaked into the community? And it's just that nobody's got really ill yet, which is why we don't know. Yeah. Once we uh, get a positive case, we do a public health investigation, contact tracing with the individual. And we will find out not only who, of course, we'll test all the, the rest of the household members and, and see if there's anyone is positive there. But also we'll find out if there is any interaction with, the, with this traveler. Uh, we will ask them. And if for those positive, we will see, depending on the where they're staying, is there any other with our neighbors or so that we can get some information on the potential of interaction with other members of the community. Do you have, do you have, how do you feel about that at the moment? Do you feel it's possible that it has already escaped into the community? We just don't know yet. I don't think it's escaped into the community. As you know, we, we continue to do our surveillance or screening. We have not had patients with symptoms that come to the hospital and been tested and test positive. So, I don't believe personally that they have escaped into the community. Okay, and is there? If, have you done this definition yet of, of the frontline workers? Has it been has it been made clear yet? They will be tested. So mentioned in the last uh, press release, they're still working on the relation to come out. But those who are in contact with travelers are considered frontline testers, and those with whole workers. Does that mean the food airport. delivery people? The food delivery people have not been as yet. Put in that list. Where there were uh, initially the list include all uh, individuals working at the point of entry, taxi drivers, but definitely the food delivery people will be one of those groups that will definitely consider to test on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. I don't. I don't think I've got anything else. For you. Wendy, if I, if I may, I'd like to just add a little bit part on the fear of persons breaching what that could mean. Um, as I stated before, the the gap between these uh, phases gives us an opportunity to uh, do an assessment on risk. Um, and um, it's the concerns that you have have been brought to the attention of many of uh, the government members in respect to whether we should reintroduce the um, tagging. Um, and I know it's something that we're going to talk about as a, as a team in the coming days. Um, but what needs to be done first, as the governor has said, is the true assessment of what the breaches are. Are they situations where people truly just don't understand that you can't talk to somebody or the delivery man comes, he's not supposed to open the door while you're there, he's supposed to drop it off. So the better analysis of it, but I understand the fear, uh, and we will do a proper assessment uh, and make a decision together as a team whether we should introduce that or not, because we understand the nerves associated with it. Okay. Talking of clarity and the need for clarity, I think there's a lot of criticism in the UK for the half half rules that were given out. They're like, oh, you know, maybe you should travel, maybe you shouldn't travel, maybe you should do this. Um, two things: are, are we going to are we going to rock, say for certain, no, you can't. Yes, you can. When when the need arises, or are you going to have this kind of? Oh, maybe you know, really, can you think about your travel? Can you think about wearing a mask? What what are we going to do? What what's your feelings about those kind of Rules once we open. I think um, in 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 connection with, with traveling, we will likely just encourage people to consider um, 
their rationale, their reasoning for, for traveling, um, and, and ensure that they just aren't traveling unnecessarily and don't take unnecessary risk. Um, in relation to things like masking, there may be circumstances, there probably will be circumstances under which, you know, we, we end up mandating masking. Okay. Also, again, for the purposes of clarity, where are we at with this 80% target? Is that a firm target in relation to October 14th? Is it firm? If we don't reach 80%, are we opening? That, well, we, we are probably not going to be stuck um, exclusively to this 80% target um, because it has, what, a, what the last um, weeks have really told us is that these targets are, are actually becoming somewhat very fuzzy and meaningless, um, particularly when it comes to, you know, the issues of the, around the Delta variant. Um, we really want to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Uh, so, you know, if, if we are, you know, quite close to that target, we may make a decision to accept it and, and, and move forward with the, the phased approach. Um, I've, I think I said in my uh, earlier remarks that that was the, the, the position. You know, we, we may not stick specifically to that 80% um, target number. So it is, it is less and less going to be a hard um, precondition to making a decision. And, and you know, we, we continue to emphasize, we continue to plead with people to go and get the vaccination because that tool is the best tool that we have available to us um, to protect the lives of our people. Um, it, it is never going to be a 100% guarantee on anything. It, we, we have certainly um, had many examples here that it doesn't prevent um, infection necessarily. It's, it reduces the chances, but it doesn't eliminate the risk of infection. Uh, we've had that here. We've had, we've had vaccinated people testing positive here. Um, we haven't, thankfully, had anybody that, um, you know, got really sick or anything. So that's actually good, a good example or a good, good, a good indication that it, it actually helps in that respect, as has been um, concluded from many other examples around the world. Okay. Um, finally, on, the, on this issue specifically, the work permit mandate, the mandate for work permit holders to be vaccinated, what's happening with that? Okay, so that, that has, um, that's still ongoing. Um, it, it became a, a, a slightly more protracted than I originally anticipated. Um, to be honest, I, I originally, I think they, I originally thought that um, there was one bill, one, one existing act, I should say, and that was Immigration Transition Act, Immigration Transitions Act, um, which um, was the governing act, but it turns out that there is three, maybe four, um, so uh, legal drafting is working on the various um, bills to make those amendments um, to, those, to those additional acts in order to, um, to accomplish what we're, we're seeking to accomplish. What about teachers? Are we there yet? And um, vaccines? That is something which is, is, uh, which is under discussion. Um, when you say are we there yet, no, we haven't made, there, there's no conclusive position in respect of that, but that is something that's under discussion. <clears throat> okay, and finally, because climate change doesn't go away, three decisions by CPA revealed this week that are horrendous and completely unsustainable. Um, what are your thoughts on them not following your policy for sustainable development? Well, I will talk to you another time about my concerns around those. Um, mm -hmm. this, is, this is particularly for, um, you know, circumstances surrounding reopening and, and COVID-related. We can talk further about that. I'm happy to answer any questions okay. separately. Thanks. Just so people saw that, so I have. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, Wendy, we'll now call on Andrel from Compass Media. God, I love Wendy. <laughs> Where's your question? Road of accident hey, as well. <laughs> uh, my first question is to Dr. Rodriguez. Um, Dr. 
Dr. Rodriguez, as of the 27th of October of August, uh, one in four HSA staff members were not vaccinated. What efforts are being done to ensure that those numbers are boosted? Well, the HSA have already implemented uh, a vaccination policy for their staff, and because we all frontline workers, so those, those staff who are not vaccinated, they will have to go to mandatory uh, testing. Apart from that, we are also facilitating for our staff to be vaccinated and facilitating clinic inside the hospital for the staff to uh, have easy access to get vaccinated. I'm not sure the one of four, that's around 75%. I believe the percentage is a little bit higher than that now, past 80 percent. I can confirm that for you, but definitely we are encouraging our staff to get vaccinated. Thank you. Naturally, the follow-up question to that, Mr. Premier, is uh, if one in four, or at the time one in four of our health services, thank you, one in four of our health services authority workers weren't uh, vaccinated, what is government's position on potentially mandating vaccinations for the wider civil service? Um, well, let's put it this way. Um, we continue to speak to um, the various components of the civil service to plead with them to go and get vaccinated. Uh, have, we haven't specifically had a conversation around how we could, you know, uh, mandate that. Um, obviously, that is. Um, I, I'm not. I'm, I, I would prefer to, to, to let the governor um, weigh in on issues like that. Um, not trying to deflect at all. But um, look, these are these are our people, and we we care very much for all of them. We we will feel a, a tremendous sense of responsibility for anybody gets sick, whether a civil service or public service or the general public. Um, so we continue to plead with them. Um, you know, there are certain areas where we we feel that we have complete justification in, in insisting that you know we can. Sort of mandate vaccines for certain certain people, but I don't think necessarily the the wider civil service um, is is absolutely one of those those um, those groups. Certainly the frontline people, yes, um, but other than that, you know, I I continue to to embrace them and beg them. Sorry, Andrew. Just to clarify, actually, as just been informed that we are the HSA is at eighty four percent right now and growing. Thank you. I'm definitely not That's one in four. Um, That's all. That's very good. Better than Mr. Four. Premier, uh, yes, children and the vulnerable remain the exposed population, and in expectation of the ongoing or the impending reopening, what policies will be put in place as far as social distancing, mask wearing, and or any other measures to protect children in school? Um. I can tell you that my, in my last conversation with the, um, the program board, I, you know, if I had to summarize it, it was, look, we need to over prepare. Um, and that means all of the things that you might, that you have indicated as examples, um, and perhaps others that you haven't uh, thought of, um, we are going to, to have them consider and balance, um, you know, the, the, the implications balance the benefits um, we are going to in you know to we, we have an obligation to the parents of the children of this country um, we have an obligation to those children directly to ensure that they are able to go to school they're able to to be protected and operate within the safest possible environment um, we're not going to cut any corners on that if it means down the road that someone looks back and says well you did certain things or you spent some money on, on certain areas that you didn't have to, I'm fine with that, as long as it saves lives. Specifically, our, in light of tomorrow's reopening, what are some of the red flags that you'll be looking for that would signal the need to not go ahead with the October date? Well, um, you know, I think we have the, the plan that we have talks about, um, you know, two different groups of infections which um, sort of end up with people uh, being hospitalized. Um, there may be other red flags that, that, that um, you know, that, that pop up from our surveillance and observations. 
Um, but I don't, I don't really anticipate that um, creating uh, a significant problem at all, because we're still being protected by the same, um, at least you know, between September 9th and and, um, and October 14th, we're still being protected by the same quarantine mechanism that has protected us all along. So while I mean, it, it is amazing that you know, and we can count ourselves very lucky and blessed that we have continued. Um, to benefit and not had um, COVID within the community. We don't expect uh, tomorrow to change that. Um, we think things will continue um, with, hopefully, knock on wood, the same kind of record. Um, obviously, if we get to October 14th um, and there has, pr uh, prior to that, been a decision to proceed with that phase, that's when the risk uh, goes up. That's when. It is quite likely that within a period of weeks we would have COVID reintroduced into our community. And we'll have to have to learn to live with it and manage it. Thank you. In the event of a potential minister, uh, Mr. Turner, in the event of potential outbreak, or perhaps some would say the inevitable outbreak or community spread of COVID-19, 42 ventilators is a far cry from 1% of the Cayman Islands population, whether we're talking about 70,000 or 60,000, 42 percent, 42 ventilated beds. What efforts are in place to ensure that we boost those numbers of ventilators and our other PPE? And also to ensure that when the borders do reopen, we don't find ourselves in a situation where potential PPE that's destined for the Cayman Islands gets seized elsewhere. I will defer that to my able Dr. Williams Rodriguez, however, I must assure you that all mechanisms are actually in place to be ahead of the curb, to not fall in that trap again. And I have been reliably informed that there are sufficient PPE resources that are already here and orders are also being procured as we speak, but I'll also allow Dr. Williams Rodriguez to expand a bit more on that. Thank you. Uh, we have enough PPE on island right now, and the orders have been placed. We have been placed in advance, so we have uh, PPE, and we are, have no concern with the amount of PPE. I see your point about the 1% of the population with the 42 ventilator, but you need to understand that out of the person who get infected with COVID-19, only a very small percentage actually get severe disease, 1% to 2% of that. And out of that uh, percentage, it's a very low percentage also will need ventilation. Again, I repeat, the 42 ventilator is enough. We will have, and we have the connection with other facilities uh, around the world and uh, providers to supply to us ventilator in the case we need it, but we feel comfortable and confident that a 42 ventilator, it should be enough in, in the worst case scenario here in the Cayman. Okay, and apart from the 42 ventilators, to have less than, I believe it, before I make an assumption, how many beds do we have to service uh, Seven patients? Seven ventilated. Not, not ventilated beds, but to service patients who might not need to be ventilated. How many beds uh, are we prepared for a worst case scenario? How many beds do we have to have? Can we, how many beds can handle a potential outbreak? As you know, the hospital have 124 beds. The Georgetown Hospital, Health City have over 200 beds. And also the field hospital is another 60 beds. So again, less than 1%. The total population, again, but if you look at the cases who actually need admission, that will be enough to cover that, that the percentage of the worldwide of patients need admission. Okay, thank you. Minister Bryan. Mm -hmm. In Sir. Light of the uncertainty surrounding October's date, what certainties can you say, or with what certainty can you say that these airlines are in fact on board? given the fact that come October 14th, you might, the borders might not reopen? Uh, well, there's no certainty in anything in life, um, but we have a working relationship like most countries do with the airlines, and they give commitments and, and hope that they will follow through. Obviously, they have to make decisions based on the demand as well, and based on our safety protocols that we put in place could potentially alter the supply and demand chain. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to resolve is the difficulty with our main source market right now with getting securely verified QR codes. 
um, and that's the U.S. Um, and our team is working really, really hard. As you heard, um, the, the IT for, for civil service has announced a strategy, and there's more being looked at. And hopefully that will resolve the concern of passengers traveling here. They can get the QR code that we can be confirmed, confident that they are securely verified, which will increase the demand. Uh, I wouldn't expect the airlines to just travel here with two people in the, on the plane. So um, I think they have the same interest as we do, which is to make, to make money, and we make money through tourism. So I don't think there's any reason to believe that they wouldn't be committed as long as the, the parameters of the um, border reopening is safe that allows persons to want to travel to the Cayman Islands. Thank you. This question would be either for uh, His Excellency the Governor or Mr. Premier, whoever feels more adequate. As far as booster shots are concerned, do we believe it's time to deviate from the UK's advice and just straight out implement it as a third shot, as has been done in the US and in, in Israel? Israel. Uh, we, we can't really deviate from the UK's advice because we're, we're getting vaccines as part of the UK program and the UK rollout, so we have to follow what the UK does. But I think, as I said in my remarks, London does recognize that our context is a bit different. So I think there is flexibility once we know London's decision on boosters, there's flexibility over how we then roll it out here, and I would be recommending that we are allowed to go as uh, as far as we as we can. But we'll have to just wait, and there's this key report hopefully coming tomorrow. But the UK Health Minister said today that both boosters will be rolled out in the UK this month. So it is this is imminent. Uh, two more questions. What is COVID is? As you rightly said, COVID will be with us for the long run. What is the plan for the long run that came announced as far as COVID-19 is concerned? Just Mr. Premier. Um, well, let me say first in relation to your earlier question, next week, tune in, be here. I hope we may have an answer then at that point, hopefully. <laughs> um, in relation to the long term, obviously, we are going to have to um, whenever it is that we, we, we reopen and, and drop the quarantine, um, we are going to have to adjust um, if what we're doing um, isn't working well, if we identify um, additional risk in certain areas, we'll have to make adjustments. And I think, um, you know, we are we're very adept at being able to, to identify risk and making those kinds of adjustments. Um, long term is something we're going to have to manage. It is, you know, it is, it is going to be a part of life. It may, it may go away um, a, in a year's time. It may be two years. It may never go away. It may become something that's, that's endemic like the flu, um, and we, we learn to live with it. Um, our, our immune systems become more um, accustomed to, to addressing it, so it becomes less problematic. I don't know. Um, you know, this is, this is crystal ball gazing to some extent. <laughs> And I, I broke mine a while ago. <laughs> but, I mean, it, you know, it is, it is obviously something that um, I'm, I am confident that we have um, a public health team and we have great um, services, medical services on the island that can address the, the concerns and that can help us get to the point where we're ensuring that we're managing this safely. Now, earlier in your address, you stated that... Um, while it is the intention of the government to open and move along with not just phase three but phase four, there is a contingency plan to provide support to the businesses and people, the Caymanian owned bit Caymanian businesses and Caymanian people, should we not be able to move along as planned. Can you say right now how much money is earmarked to help support and or continue the um, various funding programs right now? Well, I want to just clarify um, some of what you said, right? So, um, the our what, what what we have said is we are assessing um, phase four of when when the, the quarantines would would be dropped. Um, we're assessing whether we go to that point. That's when the risk goes up. That's what um, our people are concerned about, and that is where um, the tourism industry effectively sees um, the potential benefits. Um, so. We are, we are going to consider all the best information we have in the coming couple of weeks, then make a decision, 
about whether we are going to, to move forward. If we decide that we are not going to do that, at the same time we have to accept certain realities that come with a decision like that. And those realities will be supporting those individuals who will continue to be impacted, um, supporting those businesses which will continue to be negatively impacted. Um, there is obviously, as, as I said before, and as you noted, there's going to be a cost to that. Um, exactly what that is will depend on the length of time, um, but we know it, it is going to be um, a lot of money. You know, if it's if it's five or six months, if it's four months, if it's three months, um, you know, it's 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 difficult to say, but you're probably talking about um, in terms of the the, the stipend um, and in terms of um, support for businesses, it's going to significantly increase. Um, I don't I don't have a, an exact number, but you know we're talking tens of millions um, extra funding that will be required in order to to properly achieve that over a period of months. Thank you, and and I know I'm being told to go, but one last one I simply must ask is that the speaker of the house actually tweeted or made a social media post. Um, against the reopening, is this a sign of discord within your pact government, or? No, oh. no. I mean, the the the, the speaker. Um, I, I did see his his post. He is not a part of caucus. Um, he is not a part of the executive. Uh, so you know, he he may he may have that view, and it it is not impossible that the government could have a different conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. That reminds me of somebody. We have, yeah, yeah. We have some final questions uh, from uh, Ralph from the Cambodian Times, and I think Minister Turner has, has something to say. But Ralph, please, please let's go ahead. Uh, thank you, Donna, and good afternoon to the panel. I appreciate and I welcome the oh. weekly press, the return to the weekly press briefings, and I'll be that in mind. I'll be quite brief. I have four questions, Donna. Two for the Premier, and two for Mr. Uh, uh, Honourable Minister here. Um, it's regarding testing. And April started off the question in regarding testing. I wanted to ask a question regarding the period before phase four and um, random testing. Do you think that we should start random testing within the community? Right now the community is very nervous about what's happening and getting prepared. And I think there's some feel that maybe there's cases out there. And the question is, do you think we should um, start random testing within the community and can people volunteer to be tested? Um, well, that is, it is, on the volunteering part, that's, um, I suppose that's possible, and Dr. Dr. Williams would be in a much better position to indicate on that. But um, there is no reason at this point. There's no indication. There are no red flags. There, there's nothing which suggests to us that um, we should have widespread surveillance testing um, within the, the community currently. I mean, we've now gone 14, nearly 14 months um, without a single case of local transmission. Uh, so that, there, you know, that suggests that what we have been doing um, has, has worked very effectively. Very good. Um, well, regarding testing for the incoming travelers, um, we now do not test when they arrive. Right. Do you think it's something we should institute in the near future as we go forward to those dates? Um, well, I think that is something that we are going to, you know, that's a question that will be a part of the mix that we will be considering, um, you know, when we, we have further discussions with um, the program board and um, if we have the, you know, discussions with the experts from Public Health England, um, with their assistance, we, we, those are, that's, that's a question that can be resolved at the time. Um, it may be that that occurs. It may be that instead of a PCR, it becomes a lateral flow test, which is um, much easier to, to accomplish. Um, but I don't think that we're going to go away from using PCR as our mainstays in terms of determining whether somebody is, is um, affected, sorry, <laughs> infected, and whether they can, they can get out of um, quarantine or whether they can come in for that matter. Before I just, before I go, Mr. Brand, just to say, I'll help you fix your crystal ball. I think you probably will need it. I would it. welcome that. I would welcome that. 
Well, oh. <laughs> sorry, may I just ex expand on, on the testing query? Um, currently, the HSA is testing frontline workers and travelers approximately 100 a day. And when you're talking about your frontline workers, they are people in the community. So it's not like it's we're not doing it. It's actively being done as we speak. Okay, so we can sort of be confident that it's not going to come. Exactly. Okay, Mr. Brian, uh, we understand that the, uh, other airlines can now Flying. Do you have any indication that American or U.S. airlines will be traveling here within the next five weeks? Yes, I do, actually. Um, we have a schedule of the American Airlines who are intending to come in um, somewhat three days a week, actually. Three days, three, three times every day um, for four days of the week, um, starting November the 6th. Um, and then they're also... some starting in October. So it's important, I'm glad you asked the question, because I know a lot of fear about, OK, tomorrow um, Americans, or anybody for that fact, can travel here of destinations that are having outbreaks. The truth is, with our stringent uh, protocols of safety, um, many people don't want to go through the process. And sadly, even though that's a positive thing of not having a lot of people come, it's a negative thing because we don't have a lot of people coming. So our, there won't be much changes in the testing. I was going to say this to the earlier question. You won't see much changes to the testing because it will only really be the locals who are traveling back and forth all the way up to close to October 14th because all the airlines have indicated that the very first um, flight outside of Cayman Airways and British Airways to come in is actually October the 2nd. Um, many of the airlines have indicated to, to my ministry that, um, and the department that the most are mean source market. They don't want to travel with the quarantine in place. So if a decision is, is made to not um, with, take away the quarantine period, I suspect that many of those flights may reduce as well because the supply and demand is not there. And that's what the Premier is speaking about, preparing for that eventuality, because that means no work. That means the hiring plans that we had for labor, for hiring Caymanians back in the hotel, will not happen. And there's costs associated with it. Um, and the final question regarding the hotels, I know that they need time to prepare and get staffed up and so on. Have they seen any reservations for the, ne in the, for the near future? Have you heard any information from them? In respect to staffing or for reservations for persons coming? For, for guests, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the, the numbers have indicated that a lot of persons have canceled, uh, unfortunately, because of our strict protocols. Um, so it's a double-edged sword. Um, you, you want to be super safe and you put these parameters in, but it's not as convenient for uh, a, a tourist or a guest coming here. And then without the certainty that the United States is going through with this secure verification, a lot of families that, that usually book three months before say, listen, if, I, if I'm not certain that my cousin from Utah that is traveling with us from Texas can come, then I'll just go to Turks and Caicos where they're looser in their safety protocols. So they, these are some of the things that, that I hope the public can consider that with the, the, the luxury of safety that we have, it putting us at a, a, a disadvantage from a competitive perspective with other jurisdictions. Um, so yes, the other jurisdictions may see a, 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 a lot of travelers going there, but they're also dealing with COVID and deaths. We're not. So it's kind of, kind of, you can't have a cake and eat it too sort of situation, unfortunately. So it's a very tight balance on that yes. for the government yes. at this stage. Well, I wish you well. Thank I you. look forward to speaking again next week. Thank you, Thank Donna. You. Thank you very much, Ralph. Any final questions, any final, or final comments from? Sure. One Alice? final comment and um, great news um, to ease. Again, it's all about mental health and, and wellness. Mm -hmm. the, um, there's another round of approval for assistance through the health insurance premiums that has been extended to the end of the year. So I encourage people to log on to the website. That's at www.hic.ky. Um, or you can request uh, more information by giving them a call. That's 946 2084. So that's been approved to for those persons who were seeking the um, health insurance premium payment assistance program assistance programs for the end of the year. So that's how we're we're doing it in phase. So I'm I'm hoping that throughout all of this, that that has given some great relief to those who were being ably assisted by this program. Thank you, Minister Turner. Any final words? Yeah, just just one. Um, just to summarize, to say to the people of the Cayman Islands, 
no finalized decision has been made yet, and the government is committed because we love you and we care for you very, very much and your safety of your loved ones, your children, that we're going to do whatever it takes, make whatever amendments necessary to keep you safe. There's no um, foregone conclusion as to this, and that's the reason why we're going to take the advice of the technocrats and the professionals in this to make sure it's done in a safe way because that's the PAC commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Ryan. Premier Panton. Uh, I would just like to add, um, you know, my thanks to um, everyone who have um, invested their time in, in listening and watching. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, appreciate the opportunity to to speak um, and, and have have this engagement with the with the media. Um, and I want to wish everyone a safe and wonderful rest of the week. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you to the public, and of course for the, to the media for being here with us, and to our panelists for sharing this very important information uh, to the public of the Cayman Islands. You can watch this press briefing on the CIG Television YouTube channel uh, anytime. Remember, you can also go online to gov.ky as well as hsa.ky for vaccination and COVID-19 information. Until next time, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening.